Well, hi everyone, good morning. I hope you're all uh, enjoying the rain and the clouds here. Um, I feel fortunate that we weren't uh, any more affected by Hurricane Sally. Um, uh, this uh, uh, midday here, I'm just gonna go over a little bit of my work on the economic dimensions of marine fisheries policy and management. Um, as Mason explained, I work for North Carolina Sea Grant. We're a program of NOAA, the no National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, all Sea Grant programs are based uh, in coastal and Great Lakes states. Um, in the past, I actually worked for Wisconsin Sea Grant in the Great Lakes. Um, so generally, when I'm not working from home, pre-pandemic days, you find me at NC State University, although Sea Grant um, in North Carolina also has three coastal offices, so in Wanchies, uh, Moorhead City, and Wilmington. So for today, what I'm going to go over um, are, and first, just a little explanation here of uh, North Carolina Sea Grant. And then I want to spend most of my time talking about uh, a current work uh, project to look at the economic implications of U.S. states marine fisheries policy and management. So this is what uh, Mason alluded to in terms of comparing, uh, you know, kind of best practices and economic implications from other states marine fisheries policy and management. I also want to uh, go over briefly some of my past efforts um, and other studies. So I was involved with a socioeconomic analysis of the Atlantic Menhaden fishery. Um, this work was commissioned by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, I'll discuss that. Um, and I am also currently involved in an economic impact analysis for the North Carolina seafood industry. So I'll go over that as well briefly. So all about Sea Grant, for those who don't know what we do, um, our mission is this, to provide unbiased science-based information to enhance the sustainable use and conservation of ocean and coastal resources. So I here I provide the uh, kind of three-legged stool of sustainability just to uh, emphasize, you know, I really think about these three pieces all the time in my work. So the environmental implications, the economic implications, and the societal implications. Um, myself, you know, my background, I'm an environmental social scientist, an economist, so that's where my expertise lies, but I'm thinking about um, really these three pieces um, in tandem. Now our focus areas at Sea Grant, they span healthy coastal ecosystems, resilient communities and economies, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, and then environmental literacy and workforce development. So these are really our national program areas and I work on all four of them. Um, today I'm gonna kind of stay focused on the fisheries side, but obviously there are lots of connections between fisheries and our coastal communities, our working waterfronts, the economies that depend on them, and then the healthy coastal ecosystems that allow our fisheries to thrive. Now, in my role at Sea Grant, I'm on our extension team. Um, what we do at Sea Grant um, is research, extension, and education, um, as well as communications. And extension, you know, the role here is really outreach. So it's taking the science-based information that we both fund and do ourselves, um, and then getting that out to stakeholders, to coastal community leaders, fishers, managers, um, anyone who's really interested in these coastal and marine resources. I kind of see our program as an interdisciplinary department in terms of our extension specialists. We have 11 different specialists and you can see their different ranges here from water resources engineering expertise to fishery science to folks like myself in environmental social science and economics. Um, and then many of us, if not all of us, do quite a bit of group facilitation and collaboration around marine and coastal issues. 
Now I'm going to speak primarily about um, this particular work that I have been doing uh, alongside Jashira Torres. She is an economics research associate working for North Carolina Sea Grant. She's going to start a Canals Fellowship uh, next year. Uh, she just completed her master's in natural resources at NC State. And this work is funded by the UNC Policy Collaboratory uh, via funds from the North Carolina Marine and Estuarine Foundation. So I figured this is uh, what you all would want to hear about today. So in terms of this particular work, what we're trying to do is to review the economic implications of US states marine fishery management approaches and then to explore the economic effects of policy and management decisions for particular North Carolina commercial and recreational fisheries of importance. So the United States has 23 states that are responsible for managing coastal marine fisheries and related public trust resources. And so, as you might imagine, there is a diversity of approaches for regulating these you know, complex dynamics that are associated with all of these different fisheries. And so we're also working in tandem with Joel Fadry and Chris Bailey, who I believe you've heard from before. Um, they are kind of you know, going into the nuts and bolts of various fisheries management and policy approaches among all these states. And then my role with Jashira is to look at the economic implications of such approaches. So the fisheries that we are thinking about, we've decided to focus on a few that are really vital to North Carolina. So these are the top North Carolina commercial fisheries based on landings value as of 2019. So that's blue crab, um, that's summer and southern flounder, shrimp, and oysters. Now, if you look at by pounds landed, you might have a slightly different constellation here. Um, so actually, I believe striped mullet and Atlantic croaker would make the top five if we looked at pounds landed over value. In terms of recreational fisheries that we're also uh, planning to explore in this work, um, we are considering the spotted sea trout, dolphin fish, bluefish, Spanish mackerel, and king mackerel. So these are the top recreational fisheries based on pounds landed, again, as of 2019. Um, other recreational fisheries, though, of kind of management interest are the southern flounder, um, as well as red drum. So we haven't actually gotten into the recreational fisheries part of this work yet. Um, this is kind of where we're hoping to go, uh, but we'll kind of see how, how things evolve as we move through this process. Now, in terms of our research methodology, what we have settled on is a systematic literature review for this phase one. Um, so we're trying to really explore the economics literature related to fisheries management and policy across the US um, and to have very consistent selection criteria um, and then to synthesize those articles in order to glean some of the top uh, kind of results or findings that might be of interest in our own management context here in North Carolina. Now, in terms of the way that we're doing this literature search, these are some of the keywords that we've used so far. You can see that we have a lot of keywords associated with our commercial fisheries so far. Um, that's where we have focused our energy. We've really just begun this work as of uh, early August. Um, as we move into the recreational fishery side of things, we'll be adding more keywords and make sure that we're, you know, thinking about some of the same issues that uh, go along with commercial fisheries. Um, but essentially what we do is, you know, we might put in a combination of keywords in this search. And so it would be commercial fishery and economics and entry permits. Um, we're looking at the web of science. Um, that's where we are, you know, gathering all of our different articles. And we're only really starting here with peer-reviewed articles. So this is the scientific literature from the economics field. Um, and at some point, we do plan to get into a little bit of what we call the gray literature. Um, and I wouldn't even call it all that gray, um, but you know, specifically the fishery management plans that are relevant to these North Carolina species. 
um, as well as Sea Grant has a national library of, uh, of all kinds of articles and uh, projects that have been done on these different fisheries. So I have a feeling we'll be getting into there and doing also a systematic uh, literature review of that particular depository. Now in our work so far, just looking at the Web of Science peer reviewed economics literature, um, we've been able to initially we identified over a thousand records to consider a thousand different studies. Um, at that point, we started removing studies based on whether, okay, we were getting duplicates, maybe the title really didn't have anything to do with what we were thinking about. Um, at that point, we also assessed the articles for eligibility um, by reading the abstracts. Um, and eventually, we got down to um, a somewhat uh, manageable number of just over 100 studies, 121 studies to look at at this point. But again, we may be adding some keyword searches as we go along, increasing this uh, database that we're reviewing. So I want to talk about one fishery that we've done uh, this literature review for so far. Um, that's the blue crab fishery. So these are really just some preliminary um, results from that work. And uh, hopefully this will kind of get you thinking about the types of uh, uh, output that you might see from our work. All right, so for each fishery that um, we're going to cover in our, our review, we are going to give, you know, an introduction in terms of its importance in the United States as a commercial fishery, as well as its importance to North Carolina. So the blue crab fishery, this is really a, a very critical commercial species here. Um, it's only second to lobster nationally in landings value. Um, its habitat, you'll find it on the Atlantic coast as well as the Gulf of Mexico. It's really considered emblematic of the mid-Atlantic region. It's even the state crustacean for Maryland. Um, and so the highest landing revenue of any fishery for the mid-Atlantic region um, has consistently been the blue crab fishery. Um, some recent uh, data that we found from 2018 shows that it was $77 million or so. Uh, in landings value you know, for the mid-Atlantic region. Now, North Carolina, we're actually in the South Atlantic region, um, so I'll get into those numbers now. Now, in terms of its importance to North Carolina, I mean, the blue crab, it's common to all our coastal waters, um, but most inhabit the Albemarle and the Pamlico sounds and their tributary, tributaries. And it's really consistently a top commercial fishery by landings revenue in the state, as well as pounds landed. Um, so as of 2019, um, it's, the landings revenue was $25 million, again, the top commercial fishery for our state. Um, generally, the market primarily is the hard blue crab, but there are also peeler and soft crabs um, that are significant as well. Um, now, the last stock assessment of 2018 indicated that the North Carolina blue crab stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring. Um, now, a stock is considered overfished when the size remains below an established threshold. Um, in contrast, overfishing is when the harvest rate exceeds a prescribed threshold. Um, so what we've seen is that the blue crab population has fluctuated over time because of harvest pressure as well as habitat loss. Now currently, um, as of February 2020 this year, the blue crab fishery management plan approved amendment three to address the overfish status and to end overfishing within two years of adoption. Um, and so the goal is also to, you know, have the stock be rebuilt within 10 years of adoption to achieve sustainable harvest. Now I've got a couple graphs just to show you, um, you know, what's been going on with the commercial harvest over time. I want to note, you know, the years here, 1990 to 2019, you can see that the landings really peaked as of the 90s. Um, if we go back even further, I've seen some graphs that take this back to 1950. Um, you know, you'll see that some of the pounds landed actually aren't so different from current uh, times if you look back to the 60s or 70s or 80s. 
but there was certainly a peak in the 90s and then a significant decline since then. Now, if you also think about the commercial harvest um, in terms of catch per trip, um, a slightly different story emerges. So this is from 2007 to 2016. Um, and so the idea of thinking about, you know, catch per unit effort or catch per trip, um, you know, from fisheries and conservation biology science, this is an indirect measure of the abundance of the target species. And so the idea is that changes in this catch per trip or catch per unit effort are inferred to signify changes in that target species abundance. Now, generally, if you see a decreasing catch per trip, that indicates over exploitation of the resource, while an unchanging uh, catch per trip indicates sustainable harvesting. So over the last decade, I don't know that there's any, um, you know, big story to take away from the catch per trip. Um, it's been, you know, somewhat stable from just my look at the numbers. But again, you would, I would definitely suggest talking to a fisheries biology about that, a fisheries biologist about this particular data. Now, in terms of the economic and social implications of blue crab management, I want to just provide three takeaways that um, Jashira and I have found from reviewing the literature thus far. Um, so first, policymakers can take into consideration the possible outcomes of various management scenarios to identify which regulations can increase revenues while also making sure that the harvest is sustainable. Um, so there's a lot of great bioeconomic modeling studies that are out there that have looked especially at blue crab management in the Chesapeake Bay and in Virginia. I'm not gonna read through all of the results here, but these are just some takeaways from that literature um, that looks at these bioeconomic models where we're trying to optimize for revenue for the fishers, as well as maintain uh, sustainability of the stock. And so again, these uh, findings, A, B, C, D, and E, these were from specific studies done in the Chesapeake and Virginia context. Um, some of these results might not be the same for North Carolina, but it gives you a sense of the types of takeaways that can come out of bioeconomic modeling. Um, so just for example, they found in a study by uh, Bunnell um, that using maximum size limits for female crabs was not actually feasible from an economic nor biological perspective. Um, in the same study, they also found that the use of seasonal closures for females uh, permits relatively high exploitation of males um, while keeping the female crab harvest sustainable. So in terms of a management recommendation, they were more interested to see the seasonal closures or early closures over some kind of maximum size limit in order to keep this fishery both sustainable and keep revenues up for the fishers involved. Um, so next, another implication that comes out of this work is, let's see here, if we are going to do any kind of commercial harvest reduction, let us consider alternative job programs that can then bring financial stability to the fishers. Um, so this is again coming out of some work in Virginia where after the blue crab fishery was declared a failure there in 2008, winter dredging from, for crabs was actually prohibited. And then there was a program that began to employ economically impacted fishermen. And what they were set out to do was to remove abandoned derelict fishing gear. Um, so similar programs um, have been considered and attempted in North Carolina. Um, but one thing to recognize is any kind of alternative job program has to be a significant scope to generate the same amount of income lost from commercial fishing activities. Um, so I just cite the most recent uh, fishery management plan, Amendment 3 for North Carolina for blue crab, um, that most you know, North Carolina blue crab fishermen, they generate more than 50% of their income from commercial fishing. So if they are to lose you know, a significant source, of income, um, it might be challenging to come up with a government program to kind of meet their needs. 
Now third, um, in terms of successful management processes, I think a lot of us, you know, understand this in theory, uh, getting it done in practice can be another story. But in terms of kind of a, you know, a holy grail of how do we make, um, you know, a management process successful and equitable, you know, when we can bring together commercial fishers, recreational anglers, and other stakeholder groups together with the resource managers, and then have the available stock information data from our biologists, as well as the economic information, it really helps to create an environment for a shared understanding, which can then lead to a more participatory and more successful management process. So some of these um, findings from research related to the blue crab fishery in other states show how, how this can take place. So, a um, uh, Haven study um, actually showed that after participating in this Virginia program around uh, derelict crab pots, you know, what they were able to do, these commercial fishers, they started to collaborate on experimentation of biodegradable escape panels for pots, as well as the implementation of devices to limit turtle mortality in those pots. Um, and just some other kind of general takeaways is the more that we can combine, you know, the work of our research community, our educational community, as well as the personal experiences of those on the water um, that can really significantly influence the effectiveness of conservation outcomes. And a key component for this kind of, you know, learning is the engagement of all the different actors in the planning process and really to have authentic engagement with stakeholders. So this is something that, again, I think has been tried over the years, and um, it be can become quite challenging when budgets aren't there to bring people to the table. Um, and so uh, this is something that I think we always strive for, um, but have to probably make more true um, you know, time and resource commitments to make happen. So what's next for this work? We have, you know, found some of this literature for the blue crab. We're now actually focused on flounder and shrimp. Um, we are going to reevaluate as we go along the fisheries that we want to focus on. And as we're, you know, getting more input and guidance from stakeholders and our colleagues, um, you know, we're finding more kind of great literature that we want to bring, uh, you know, on into this work. Um, and I already specified in terms of the recreational fisheries, this is where we plan to go. But again, we haven't started that work, so we may, you know, switch some species around depending on interests that are out there. Um, now, I do want to pivot and talk a little bit about some other projects that I've been involved in, and then I'll also provide at least 15 minutes at the end of this, maybe longer, so that we can all uh, discuss or if you have questions, I can answer at that time. So pivoting, um, I do want to tell you a little bit about my work with the Atlantic Menhaden fishery. Um, so I was um, uh, commissioned or, um, you know, uh, had a funded project by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission to characterize the socioeconomic data um, from this fishery. And so this actually involved collecting a lot of original data from fishers themselves. Um, and then analyzing this economic and sociological data in order to inform um, the Menhaden fishery management plan at the time. Um, so for those of you that don't have a lot of background on Menhaden, you can see here it's being caught off the waters of Virginia. Um, it's a very large fishery in terms of pounds landed in the United States. It's number two. Um, although it's something you're never going to see on your dinner plate, it's a very, you know, oily, bony fish. Um, and what we use it mostly for is fish, oil, and meal as inputs to, you know, aquaculture feeds, hog feeds. You might find it in your dog food, omega-3 supplements. Um, so it has a very important role, but it's more of an input in the types of products that you might be more familiar with. So this is just um, a graph showing the Menhaden pounds landed on the Atlantic coast 
from 2000 to 2015. You'll notice a slight decline over time. Um, but what I mostly want to show you here is that in orange, this is the reduction oil and meal product. That's where most of the menhaden goes. Um, and then in blue, uh, there is also, um, you know, a decent sized bait market. Um, so uh, if you're wondering, you know, what does this have to do with blue crab or some of the work I was talking about earlier, menhaden are actually used as a bait in crab pots. Um, and so we used to have a reduction uh, processing facility in Beaufort. It closed in 2005 and it actually converted menhaden to these oil and meal products. Now all we have is a small bait fishery in North Carolina for menhaden. So in terms of state allocations, um, you know, Virginia, uh, really, they're the, the behemoth here. So they have 85% of total allowable catch. Um, for New Jersey is next with about 11%. And I just put in the rest of the states so that we could get down to North Carolina. Currently, our allocation is only half of 1%. Um, and so the only remaining processing facility for this oil meal product is in Reedville, Virginia, and that's where most of the catch is going. So some of the questions that were asked, um, you know, by myself and my uh, co-PI, that's John Whitehead at Appalachian State University, um, about the Atlantic Menhaden was, what is the value of the fisheries market and non-market products? How does the fishery contribute to the regional economy? And then how do various harvest allocation scenarios impact the livelihoods of fishers? And so this is the type of you know, questions that we were trying to answer. And what we did was actually to collect a mix of quantitative and qualitative data. Um, I had several uh, research assistants working with me and we traveled up and down the Atlantic coast talking to Menhaden fishers, uh, processors, dealers. Um, you know, we actually got to visit the Reedville plant. Um, it's a very smelly place, uh, as you can imagine, uh, very fishy, but it was, um, you know, a really good learning experience for me to see, you know, what these guys are doing um, and how important it is to that local economy, especially in coastal Virginia. Okay, so when I'm thinking about market value and non-market value, economic value in total of a fishery, I kind of go back to the basics, um, which I think of as you know, the ecosystem services that are provided by this resource. And so these are really you know, what humans get out of these natural resources. And fisheries, um, in particular for Menhaden, I would say that it's mostly related to provisioning, so eventually um, towards a food product, um, cultural ecosystem services, so you can think of the traditions of fishing, what it means to have an ongoing working waterfront community, you know, it's really a way of life. Many of the fishers that, you know, I speak to in North Carolina, as well, as, well as the Menhaden fishers, you know, they're third generation, fourth generation, some I know are seventh generation. This is definitely, you know, part of their, uh, their families long going or ongoing livelihoods. Um, and then another ecosystem service that's very important um, is supporting. So some of the nutrient cycling aspects of these fisheries and particularly with regards to menhaden, which I'll get into in a moment. Now, I just wanna give some examples of these ecosystem services. As I mentioned, the provisioning elements from menhaden. And I'm going to play a uh, short clip from the manager of that processing facility in Reedville. Um, and so let's just hear from him the way that he kind of sees, you know, what's the value of this product. Concentrate and then take the 
damn nasty because you smell out of it. <laughs> that is going to be the one of the most valuable products on earth. Mm -hmm. It's a healthy protein. Okay, so let's uh, move on here to think about some of the cultural ecosystem services. This is a short clip from a fisher based out of Cape May. He uses menhaden for his own personal use, so he likes to catch conch and dogfish, um, and he is a commercial fisher. Yeah, so what you hear from him is, you know, how important the commercial fishing is to him, but even still, he's not sure that he sees it as a future for the next generation, and that's something we do often hear in these kind of interviews. Um, and then finally, supporting ecosystem services. So, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, menhaden are very important from the perspective of their ability to cycle nutrients. So they consume plankton, and then they also provide forage for striped bass, bluefish, weakfish, birds, whales. Um, and so to explore, you know, really uh, kind of societies or our Atlantic Coast residents' um, perceptions or importance of these supporting ecosystem services, I worked with John Whitehead as well as another collaborator, Alexandra Nemenko, um, an economist who's now at James Madison University. And we conducted a citizen preference survey. Um, and we were really interested in what people along the Atlantic coast think about ecosystem-based fisheries management, specifically for Menhaden. And we asked them a lot of different questions in order to determine the way that they might make trade-offs between harvest levels and jobs, and then these supporting ecosystem services. So, you know, we would ask them to think about, okay, assume there's a certain harvest level, a certain number of jobs, and that's going to correspond with, you know, bluefish and these different, uh, you know, fish that depend on menhaden. Um, you know, we'll see an increase in their population, no change, or a decrease. We ask them to think about water quality. So if water quality changes, um, are they willing to make a trade-off between harvest level and jobs and a water quality change? Or are they willing to make a trade-off between harvest level jobs and then, you know, birds that depend on menhaden for their own food? Um, and so just, uh, you know, in general, what we did find is that the general public has a significant demand for ecosystem-based fisheries management relative to traditional species-specific management. And so this is something that the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission has been working on. They are going beyond the typical single species, you know, biological stock assessments for menhaden, and they're looking at interactions between menhaden and other species to make decisions. So if you're interested in more in this work, we have a paper coming out in the Journal of Contemporary Economic Policy. Um, if you want to see all of our work on Atlantic menhaden, you can just Google probably my name, Harrison, and Atlantic Menhaden, you'll see there's, you know, I'm sure probably a 200 page report out there of everything we did on this fishery. Um, so it's, you know, with fisheries management and the economics of it all, um, you can kind of think about it in a broad brush, um, or you can go super deep into every piece. And so the Menhaden was one place where we tried to do that. Um, now, finally, I do want to let you all know that I'm involved with an economic impact analysis for the North Carolina seafood industry, and that should be completed at the end of this fall. It was funded by the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries Commercial Fishing Resource Fund, so that comes from commercial uh, fishing uh, fee licenses. And so um, that is work that I'm doing with a number of economists throughout the state, Chris Dumas at UNC Wilmington, uh, John Whitehead at Appalachian State University, Barry Nash of North Carolina Sea Grant, 
um, as well as uh, Eric Edwards and Sarah Sutherland of NC State University and Duke, respectively. And so what we're doing is collecting and analyzing novel costs, so new cost data and supply chain data for the state to look at our seafood harvesting, processing, and distribution sectors. Um, we've also um, conducted a survey with North Carolina residents to understand uh, and quantify their demand for North Carolina seafood products. Um, and then at the end of the day, we will have an EIA, an economic impact analysis of our wild capture seafood industry. And so just to give you a little bit of a picture of the different types of you know, economic kind of sectors that are involved. Um, you know, you can think from, you know, really from the fish that gets harvested, brought to the dock, all the way to your plate. There's a lot of different people involved here. So whether you have, you know, your boat builders, your equipment suppliers, your marina operators um, that are all making what the commercial harvesters do possible, and then they're selling and the value continues on between the seafood dealers, the processors, the packers, eventually the transportation, the logistics, um, until you see that seafood product at your grocery store, at a restaurant, or a seafood market. Um, so really trying to bring together all of these different pieces. 